So, so welcome to the Multidisciplinary Molecular Tumor Board on Colorectal Cancer today. We will mostly be focusing on uh, colon cancer only today, so the rectal part, I think uh, we just didn't have enough time to include that. So starting with the introductions, uh, everybody is aware of Dr. Shah, who is um, the president of the Binetara Foundation. My name is Dr. Siddharth Yadav. I'm uh, assistant professor at Mayo Clinic. I'll be moderating the session today. Joining us today as uh, featured faculty or experts uh, are Dr. Yon Rona Yeager from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. Hagen Kennecke from Virginia Mason, Dr. Axel Grothy from West Cancer Center, and Dr. Sakti Chakrabarty from Medical College of Wisconsin. So before we go into our cases, um, just want to briefly talk about uh, colon cancer in the U.S. Uh, you know, we have approximately 150,000 uh, new cases every year, 50 thousand plus deaths every year, and it is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the U.S. if you combine male and females. So definitely something that is very common and very relevant to our today's uh, discussion. <coughs> so let's just start with our cases. So case number one, patient is a 61-year-old female who was found to have a mass in ascending colon after undergoing first screening colonoscopy. So she has never undergone colonoscopy in the past. Biopsy demonstrated colon adenocarcinoma, and she undergoes surgical resection, and final pathology demonstrates it's poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. The P stage is T3, so it's uh, invading into the serosal area, but it's not really outside of the uh, lumen of the, uh, outside of the serosa. There is lymphovascular invasion present, but no perineural invasion. And a total of 14 lymph nodes were removed, and they were all negative for involvement. The so final path at this time is PT3 and 0, and uh, you know, universal screening of, uh, for uh, Lynch syndrome and uh, mismatch repair proteins. Uh, so this was performed, and there was a expression of NMR proteins. So the question here is, he's referred to medical oncology for further discussion on adjuvant therapy. And the question is, does he require chemotherapy or not? And so my, I'm not a colon cancer person, so, uh, but my thought process to going through fellowship was stage one, observe, no chemotherapy, stage three, give chemotherapy to everybody, and stage two, you sort of uh, risk a stratify and decide whether somebody needs chemotherapy or not. So what are the factors that we typically think of when we are thinking of uh, risk stratifying in stage two colon cancer? So of course there is clinical pathological features which uh, would include your T4 lesions, then lymphovascular invasion, which is what our patient has, perineural invasion, which our patient does not have, if there is any obstruction caused by the tumor or perforation caused by tumor, and then poorly differentiated tumors, which our patient has. And if there is a inadequate lymph node sampling, then of course that's also considered as a high risk factor. So if there are two or more of these risk factors present, then we typically tend to think of them, the patient being a high risk and consider adjuvant chemotherapy. Whereas then there is the other side of this is the molecular alteration. So MSI, MMR status obviously is a big factor in deciding who needs chemotherapy or not and then there is oncotype DX, and then there are a bunch of other factors. We will go through all of these uh, separately and look at some of the evidence in terms of the molecular alterations. But at this point, I just want to bring in the panel right now just to get to your initial thought on would you offer chemotherapy to this patient or not? And we can start with uh, um, Dr. Grothy. I'll uh, let you lead first. And you put me on the spot. <clears throat> so, I mean, the... So when you look at the clinical pathologic features that you've listed here, they are not equally ranked, you know. So, I mean, PT4 is clearly the most important one. Lymph node sampling less than 12, these two are the most important ones. And I actually believe that perineal invasion is underrated. Um, so from these standard clinical factors, you know, um, they're not equal. And if you do multivariate analysis, you know, something like obstruction perforation actually normally falls out. I mean, so these are not necessarily the same thing. A poor, differentiation, poor differentiation also is completely useless if you have an MSI high tumor, for instance. It's not a, a risk factor. So these are the, let's say, soft risk factors that are associated here. Lymphovascular invasion, poorly differenti poor differentiation here. It's not T4, it's not less than 12 lymph nodes. So this is really a, a, a shared decision-making between patients and, and physicians that can, where aid factors in patient expectation, et cetera. And I'm not trying to kind of 
um, wiggle myself out of the recommendation here. But here, I really have equipoise. I would really think, you know, both, um, you know, decision ways, you know, are right. And uh, I would actually think and this is exactly where we like to see data like CTDNA, other molecular factors, to help us make a decision. Got you. Um, let's uh, go to Dr. Yeager from uh, Memorial. Um, Dr. Yeager, do you have any thoughts on this? I agree with Axel, and I agree with the schema that you showed. So in patients who are stage 2 colon cancer, the decision about chemotherapy is not so straightforward. And both you look at these risk factors and you also speak with patients to understand how much risk they're willing to tolerate and um, if they're willing to leave any potential benefit on the table. I think um, at this point, most of our decisions are based on these clinical pathologic features other than MSI. And um, I think some of the other features we're going to talk about are hope for the future to refine who we treat. <clears throat> Dr. Kennedy, um, what are your thoughts? On the, yeah, I didn't uh, hear you. Yeah, look, I, I agree with the comments. I, I agree that the histologic criteria in colorectal cancer for risk are a little bit on the weaker side. I, I am concerned about this 61-year-old woman's colon cancer and, and her risk of relapse. I think it is uh, uh, more elevated because of the LVI. Um, poorly deaf, I think, is relevant given that it is a PMMR tumor. So, you know, I think she would have been a, a candidate for the, you know, the stage two high risk idea uh, a study. Um, I would discuss with her the value of, of chemotherapy. I don't know, we're talking about, you know, type and duration, but something like three months of KBOX. I think would be appropriate um, if you're kind of going in the uh, more, uh, you know, cutting edge uh, CTDNA, COBRA study. Uh, I think those are, are also important considerations. I think you're going to talk about those in a little bit. Gotcha. Dr. Chakraborty, any any different thoughts than everybody, what everybody else has already mentioned? No, I think um, um, I think the, the recommendation that uh, I'd like I'd like to add that you know these kind of patients at the fertile ground for investigating the value of TTDNA and venous score. Yeah. Not that we can use it right away uh, outside of a clinical trial, or maybe uh, because CMS has decided to cover TTDNA for stage two and three patients. So so I would like to um, ask the panel. What would be your stand on offering CTDNA for this patient outside of a clinical trial after full disclosure of pros and cons, given the fact that CMS uh, is going to cover this test? So I think uh, we are going to come to CTDNA in just okay. a little bit, so I, I'll let you, uh, so we can come back and address that question in just few slides. So let's go and so it seems like at least our panel at this point seems to be, um, you know, um, we are kind of undecided in terms of whether this patient truly needs uh, chemotherapy or not, and it's uh, shared decision making at this point. So let's look at some of the molecular alterations in stage 1 to 3 colon cancer and their prognostic versus predictive impact on clinical outcomes. So you know, I think the big one that we always think of is MSI or MMR status. And uh, if you look at uh, stage two disease, so on your uh, left, uh, so these are your stage two patients. Uh, and if you look at disease-free survival, those with uh, DNA mismatch repair um, defect, which is in your yellow, they tend to do quite well with uh, uh, surgery alone. And 5-FU, in fact, uh, leads to worse prognosis. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why if somebody has a defective mismatch repair uh, in stage two, a lot of uh, us would not uh, probably offer chemotherapy. And I think that's where, uh, but this patient that we are talking about has a proficient mismatch repair. And if you look at, that's where your uh, curve C comes in, is with 5-FU and surgery, they are pretty much overlapping, meaning there is no difference in uh, the disease-free survival mm -hmm. with uh, chemotherapy. So. 
This is uh, looking at, uh, which I found interesting, was looking at stage three uh, colon cancer and looking at, at uh, your KRAS, BRAF, and MMR status. And then classifying patients into low risk, which are your T1 to T3 or N1s, and then your high risk, which are your T4 or N2s, and looking at the overall outcomes. And what was interesting to me was the five-year recurrence-free survival uh, by MMR status. If you look at everybody, low versus high risk, low risk obviously does better compared to high risk. Um, but if you classify it by uh, mismatch repair pro uh, protein status, so deficient mismatch repair protein in uh, low risk um, tends to do better compared to those with uh, proficient mismatch repair proteins. However, if you look at high risk, the difference does not exist between uh, deficient mismatch repair and uh, proficient mismatch repair. And so I think uh, the first question that comes up is obviously how do you use MSI MMR status in stage two and in stage three <laughs> bone cancer? And the question would also be in terms of looking at uh, do you, even in stage three, do you sort of uh, classify patients based on low risk versus high risk and use the MSI MMR status? Now, so let me start with um, Dr. Chakrabarti. I'll go to you this time first. So. Uh, well, um, I think uh, there are several unresolved issues here, although the NCCN guideline uh, says stage 2 MSI high, um, no chemotherapy is a reasonable choice, uh, but I just wonder how about T4 MSI high stage 2 patients. Um, and secondly, uh, I think the Jerome Gallone group has uh, published very <coughs> strong data uh, showing that in MSI high patients, immunoscore has a very um, has a good discriminative um, uh, use. So, uh, but I think overall, I'm in favor of uh, not offering chemotherapy uh, unless maybe it is two for tumor. Dr. Kennedy, I'll go to you next. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh on is there a subset of patients even within um, stage three who are, let's say, MSI high who do not need chemotherapy, um, and in within stage two who are MSI high who need chemotherapy? Okay, I wish I knew. Uh, obviously, um, MSI status is incredibly relevant in the stage two setting, and I I think it's uh, it's hard to argue to give. Um, adjuvant chemo, uh, whether uh, even if it's with uh, KFOX or FOFOX uh, to uh, uh, DMMR stage two. So I generally would not do that um, in the setting of, of stage three. Um, I think I think that's a very uh, nice finding that uh, it's not a great uh, prognostic factor in the node positive setting, although there have been other studies showing that it does uh, confer a, a reduction in risk of relapse regardless of stage. Um, overall, I think I would offer adjuvant uh, full FOX or, or KFOX in the setting of, of stage three um, uh, DMMR uh, colon cancer. Uh, there's again the duration of therapy discussion. And then of course we have the atomic study. I've, I've put a couple of patients on that and uh, it's an important question to, to answer. We definitely have equipoise there. Dr. Yeager, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I would agree. So as it showed in stage two MMR deficient disease, um, patients have really good outcomes overall. So um, I generally don't give adjuvant chemotherapy. And as mentioned for stage three disease, we give um, doublet treatment with a platinum, not 5 alone. And um, I, I as well have been able to get some patients on the atomic study looking at full box versus full box plus the two in that. So I'll go go back to Dr. Grothy. Uh, Dr. Grothy, what are your thoughts? I mean, is there like T4 and zero um, uh, with uh, high MSI that you would offer chemotherapy, <laughs> and then maybe there is a subset in uh, within stage three um, with high MSI that you would not offer chemotherapy. Yeah, these are exactly the holes in our knowledge that you just pointed out because, I mean, there are Twitter discussions about the MSI high T4 stage 2 patient, um, and, you know, the the opinions go across the board. So I believe, you know, that uh, overall we know the relevance of MSI high is more uh, kind of important and we know clarified in stage 2 than in stage 3. 
but they are the overlapping, you know, prognostic groups between T4 N0 and let's say T3 N1A, you know, which is kind of has actually overall a better prognosis than T4 N0. Um, so I again, this goes down to an individual discussion. I think if I give um, T4 N0 and as a high cancer uh, adjuvant treatment, it would be three months of KPOX and not more. You know, we need not subplot in this uh, approach here because flow primitives alone would work. Um, so that's really talking about, um, you know, expectations, et cetera, side effects that uh, we would inflict on patients. There's not one clear answer. And I don't think, you know, we'll never have a prospective study that will uh, really answer these questions. We will get some data from a more, you know, say detailed MSI analysis from the IDEA collaboration. Um, and with the idea of having stage two and stage three patients, at least in four studies. Um, so stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer this question at some point. Perfect. So the other thing that comes up is, in this patient, would you order oncotype DX uh, colon to decide on adjuvant chemotherapy? So we do know that the you know, oncotype DX uh, colon score is available, and uh, that based on uh, your high versus low score, you can decide uh, whether somebody needs chemotherapy or not. What was also interesting to me was uh, looking at the uh, breakdown by uh, MMR status, and so I think what was interesting to me was if you if somebody is T4 and MMR proficient, even at, with the low score, their uh, risk is high enough that I think uh, maybe everybody would offer chemotherapy. And if somebody is T3 and MMR deficient, they're even with a high oncotype colon score, their risk is low enough that maybe chemotherapy could be avoided. And this is where our patient falls in in T3 and MMR proficient. So. Let me go back to the panel, and this time I'll start with Dr. Yeager. Would you order Oncotype DX uh, on this patient to decide uh, on chemotherapy? So I think you show here that the Oncotype uh, DX score has agnostic information, but it doesn't really guide us on who will respond to the treatment, so who will benefit from adjuvant treatment. So in our center, we don't use Oncotype DX and make decisions on adjuvant therapy. Um, it doesn't provide uh, predictive data for us. Um, to guide us to say um, this person should go through treatment beyond what we have that's prognostic from the clinical pathologic features. Dr. Grothy, what are your thoughts? So I completely agree. I mean, when you look at the um, breakdown, it's a, even the prognostic information. When you look at the risk groups that are being separated out by Oncotype PX, compare this to the risk group and prognostic implication of ctDNA. There's a world, they are world apart. So I personally have never used Oncotype DX in my clinical practice because I'm just not convinced that it really guides my, my treatment approach as much as, you know, people think it would. When you go back one slide, you know, on the, in the screen here, you also see when you look at how many patients fall in which area, you know, they are clustered in the middle. And this is really where most of the patients will end up. So for the average patient, the really, yeah, exactly. And the curve overall for the T3 and zero, uh, T3 uh, patient is pretty flat, you know, and it's not as steep, and you'll show the CTDNA data later, as you see with more, let's say, advanced and more innovative and more modern prognostic indicators. So again, I don't think, you know, and I know breast cancer is all gung-ho about Oncotype PX, Mm -hmm. um, that's that's kind of a that's gospel, but you know, in in colon cancer, oncotype DX is disappointed. Gotcha, Dr. Kennedy or Dr. Chakravarti, any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think um, the it's nice to see oncotype DX being mentioned. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we use all used to use it a little bit more, but really, it sometimes it helps guide the patient discussion. I used to treat a lot of breast cancer, and in that setting, the Oncotype score, of course, it's a completely different uh, molecular assay. Uh, it, it's not only prognostic, but it's also predictive. It'll predict benefit from chemo, and of course, we know that that is not the case with the Oncotype for a DX for colon. So, a whole lot less useful for that, so not, um, I don't rely on it as much anymore. Perfect. Okay, so um, we talked about the prognostic versus predictive role of Oncotype DX, so it seems uh, that this is more prognostic rather than predictive. So uh, 
So ctDNA, and this is where I think um, a lot of excitement uh, is happening, and uh, this is just looking at some of the data on ctDNA. We know that it's prognostic, uh, the 30-day ctDNA sort of uh, impacts your overall um, uh, rates of uh, recurrence-free survivals if you are ctDNA positive versus negative. We also know that if you're ctDNA positive and then turn negative, maybe you have a better outcome compared to the, those who continue to be positive. Um, so let me bring in the panel again at this time, and um, let's talk about ctDNA a little bit. So I will start with Dr. Chakraborty. So how often do you use ctDNA, and uh, how often have you found it to be useful? Well, um, I am impatiently waiting uh, to use this tool uh, because I think recently CMS has decided to cover it, so we'll be able to explain it to our patients. Looking at the data, uh, especially the data uh, published by Gene Tai from Australia and then the Reiner Group, uh, this tool looks uh, incredibly powerful. So at this time, you know, if there is a stage two patient, like the patient you just described, if this, this patient shows ctDNA positive in the post-operative period, uh, I, I think, and again, I would like to know uh, other panel members' opinion, I think it will, be, it will be very difficult not to offer adjuvant chemotherapy to that person. Um, so, Dr. Kennedy, what are your thoughts on this? So it's, it's certainly the most uh, controversial and the newest kid on the block here. Um, I'm assuming we're still talking about the early stage setting, and I'm assuming we're talking about a, a custom tumor-informed assay. And overall, I, I think those are the ones, you know, certainly in the early stage setting, if we're going to talk about that, that you know I think have the most common <laughs> in terms of uh, sensitivity. And um, do I use them routinely in clinical practice to guide the recommendations for adjuvant therapy? I, I confess I do not. I have ordered them. I think there are big questions out there regarding, you know, is it just one uh, assay or does it have to be sustained? If you do it, how frequently uh, do you have to repeat it? The general guidance, uh, if you look at the label, uh, recommendations would be every three months. So, you know, that's a long time in terms of adjuvant decision-making and deferral. So I, I, I am really looking forward to doing the trials. I don't routinely use it in clinical practice at this time. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yeager, uh, you earlier mentioned that you would not use Oncotype GX. What about ctDNA? Would you consider ordering ctDNA in this patient? So as I mentioned before, at this point, we don't use this. Um, Part of our standard approach to patients who are early stage. I've uh, used CTD and track patients who are metastatic, but in early stage disease, it's, it's um, not yet um, part of really um, guiding our clinical decisions. I think the data is clear that if someone has positive CTDNA, they have high risk for recurrence, and we would think that there's still with some tumor there, and the specificity is there, but the sensitivity is not. And how to act on it is not clear. And the best way would be to think on And there are trials now um, in stage three disease um, trying to guide the use of further treatment in stage two to uh, look at outcomes based on ctDNA. Um, in my practice, we have a, a few patients um, used it as um, um, uh, something to follow, but not something to make decisions based on. Patients who don't have markers that are easy to follow, don't have CEA before, um, sometimes um, in, a, in a patient who uh, is very educated and asks for the test, I think um, um, I've done this test in that setting, but I don't use it as a tool to make decisions in early stages. Thank you. So, Dr. Grothy, um, you had mentioned earlier about ctDNA. Would you consider ordering it, and how often do you do this in your practice uh, using ctDNA? Uh, since January, every patient of stage 2 and 3 colon cancer has received ctDNA testing. Um, and so we have about 56 patients right now that were, um, that actually ultimately, of course, they need to agree to that, et cetera. Um, there are two patients who actually made treatment decisions on uh, the assay because, I mean, they're, they're, let me let me backtrack. There are a couple of decisions you can think about making decisions and make a uh, kind of criteria where you can make decisions on. Number one, if you have a low risk stage two cancer where you normally do not give adjuvant chemotherapy, 
and you have a CTDNA positivity, the, the specificity for recurrence within the next um, three years is 99.8%. So that's really almost a guarantee. That's the that's the performance characteristic of the study, uh, of the, the, the test. Even with one test, if you add two positive tests sequentially, it goes up to virtually 100%. And the sensitivity actually also goes up if you do sequential testing. Um, there are data that, you know, once you're positive and you give adjuvant therapy, that's the RINA data, um, you actually can salvage at least short-term patients. They do not necessarily go down to 100% recurrence rate. They plateau off at 40 to 50%. Okay, so how often is that? How common uh, do we see lower stage two patients with positive CTDNA test? That's about uh, five to six percent. So these patients exist, and these two patients that I had, actually, I talked to them, and we made a decision to use adjuvant chemotherapy. You can even follow the CTDNA levels and see whether these uh, uh, markers disappear. The question that I have on stage three, of course, is can we use a negative test with whole? treatment or treat at a later time point when the test turns positive, because we know the lead time to radiographic detection is about 10 months. There's still a curable situation. That's actually something that, that's going to be uh, investigated in an upcoming, which I think is very important, intergroup trial, the cancer ID study. Now, the other uh, question is, of course, what do, you, what do you have a negative test and you don't see anything on scans? You know, that's, of course, the situation we're facing. Now, first of all, a positive uh, test would trigger a more, let's say, comprehensive workup. And that's another situation where I actually saw a patient who where would normally not have done an NRI liver or PET CT scan at this point in time and be found resectable disease. So, I mean, again, individual information, this is not yet validated on a large scale. I encourage people to enroll patients into ongoing randomized trials and also observation cohort studies because we need to figure out what's going on. But this is the one marker, this one test is going to change the way how we treat patients in the adjuvant setting. And not just in colon cancer, virtually in across medicine. Absolutely. So my question to Dr. Roti, though, when you are ordering these tests, on what post coverage day you ordered the first blood test? Is it day 21, <clears throat> is it 5? Yeah, it has to be more than two weeks after surgery. I mean, that's really the critical issue because between, you know, up to two weeks, normally, you know, really, realistically, patients don't come within two weeks after surgery. They come after three to four weeks. By that time, the kind of surgery based or, you know, pre surgery based DNA should be washed out. Um, you know, the point is, this, the high specificity of this test is really intriguing, the 99.8%. That's actually tweaked just recently after the one false positive test that was in by my patient, because uh, there was admittedly one false positive test, you know, because really um, in, in, it happened to be actually two false positive tests in the United States, and one was my patient, so they tweaked the performance of the test, and the sensitivity went from 99.6% to 99.8%. Because you know that's really where we want to be. Axel, can you comment on the assay? I'm assuming you're talking about the, the Terra. Yeah, <clears throat> and then so the, the yeah. reimbursement yeah. experience that you've had. Um, so first of all, I mean, so the reimbur it's reimbursed now by Medicare, and uh, the company actually says, you know, in for colon cancer patients right now, if there's no coverage, they would perform the test for free. That's all I can tell you. We've never had reimbursement issues with it. Yeah, thanks. All right, so moving forward. So interrupt, uh, said on. Um, sure. So from uh, attendees, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat box and the panelists will uh, take your questions. If you have a question to a specific panelist, uh, name that uh, faculty. Otherwise, you know, we, we can have uh, uh, the faculty just uh, look at the chat and respond to you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. So moving on to looking at KRAS, BRAF, NRAS, and uh, PIC3CA in uh, the adjuvant setting. So if you look at KRAS versus BRAF, I mean, they are almost mutually exclusive um, NRAS. Uh, you know, so KRAS constitutes the majority of uh, molecular abnormalities in colon cancer, followed by PIK3CA, BRAF, and then NRAS. The question here really is, uh, you know, if you look at a stage two and three colorectal cancer, and then you look at BRAF mutation, you do see that um, cases with BRAF mutations tend to do worse uh, compared to cases without BRAF or wild-type BRAF mutation. Um, 
Now, this is a more of a prognostic marker rather than a predictive marker, but the question always is, how do you use uh, BRAF along with uh, your mismatch repair protein status? So even in MMR, those with mismatch repair protein proficient or deficient, BRAF seems to further stratify these patients into higher risk or lower risk. So if you look at this uh, curve over here, you can see that uh, those with uh, mismatch repair protein uh, profic uh, deficient and have a BRAF mutation have almost similar um, or outcomes compared to those who are BRAF wild type and mismatch repair protein proficient. Um, so that sort of always makes me wonder, should we also be, in addition to MSI, MMR, should we also be looking at BRAF to look at prognosis and how would we uh, use that information? So I'd again like to bring back the panel and just talk briefly about is there any role of checking for uh, checking KRAS, BRAF, and RAS in the adjuvant setting at all? So I will start with Dr. Kennedy. Yeah, um, these are, it's uh, always been an interesting and tempting question uh, looking at these biomarkers that are so important in the advanced setting in the uh, earlier stage setting. I, uh, I have seen the, the ROS uh, data about the prognostic impact um, in, uh, in the early stage setting. I think it is notable that the endpoints there uh, are in the overall survival, which may relate to uh, more distant um, uh, events uh, after the relapse event. But, I mean, overall, I have, I'm not familiar with good evidence of using these markers in the uh, stage two, three setting, particularly not for decision making. We know BRAF, you know, is associated with uh, DMMR status, but that is really doesn't drive the um, uh, uh, DMMR uh, behavior uh, that we know of. Uh, so overall, I, I don't use the uh, KRAS or BRAF in this stage two, three setting in, in decision making or even testing. Dr. Grothy? So Hagen, what if you had a single trial available that you could accrue to for BRAF inhibition in let's say early stage disease? And I mean, we do it reflexively, you know, if you have an MMR deficient tumor, you know, then you definitely get BRAF, you know, to see whether you're lynch or somatic. Um, but I, I can, I hope, you know, that at some point with the emergence of more treatment options for patients in the adjuvant setting, um, you know, we will be able to, uh, we would actually be encouraged to test for BRAF. Right now, as you say, it's not, let's say, one of the things that are on top of my mind at this point in time, but if I saw a clinical trial available right. with a BRAF targeted approach, I would definitely think, you know, we need to, talk, uh, need to test for BRAF. Perfect. What do you think, Roma? Yeah, I, of course I agree. Uh, hopefully we'll have clinical <laughs> trials with the adjuvant set your house. Um, I think um, in terms of the graph you showed of the BRAF and MSI, if you look at the stage three um, uh, deficient MMR or proficient MMR, the, the um, outcomes, um, the clinical features vary by BRAF status. There's more T4 and 2 in the BRAF mutated. So it's there are factors that are traditional factors that will also segregate by BRAF status. So we don't use it right now in our clinical decision making. We can imagine kind of building off what Axel said in the CFPNA that we will come to a point where we'll have the BRAF therapy may be KRAF allele specific treatment and we'll use CFDNA to see who needs it and we can hopefully one day have um, treatment that's going to be much more selective. Um, against the whatever whatever the tumor is, and I think um, BRAF is a little bit ahead right now since we have targeted therapy. So hopefully we'll have the trials looking at that um, starting um, uh, the analysis of that approach. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I think you know to sort of summarize what we are seeing, um, you know, at the back to this case, I, I think there isn't a, a straightforward answer, but I think. More so, I think we are coming at uh, this point where we are thinking of do clinical pathological features along with molecular alterations, how do we use all of this? And then I just uh, wanted to show um, this uh, subset analysis, analysis of the IDEA study published in India, and um, Dr. Ruth is here as well, so he could comment. I think uh, what was interesting to me was there was a lot of subset analysis performed by the clinical pathological features, but uh, none by molecular alterations. So, 
one of the questions that I had was, you know, while we are already using the, you know, the clinical pathological features in deciding who gets three months versus six months of uh, KPOX, uh, what about uh, putting uh, molecular abnormalities into this and looking at that as well and deciding on duration of treatment and treatment escalation or treatment de-escalation? So at this point, I would just want to bring the panel again to just give your final thoughts on uh, adjuvant treatment and what directions where you are seeing uh, that, that this field is heading in terms of how we will use molecular alterations and clinical pathological features together in the future. So I'll start with you, Dr. Grothy, since this, is, uh, this was your study. Yeah. So. So, I mean, this paper focused really on the uh, clinical um, pathologic features, also because, you know, this, this study took more than a decade to, from first patient to, um, you know, really publication in the end. So, all these molecular markers we talked about were emergent you know, at that point. So, we don't have full data set on, on these molecular markers. We're going actually back right now and see what we can salvage here. Uh, so there will be a, a presentation or a publication about the molecular markers within the idea to see whether longer duration dose intensity makes sense in certain subgroups. Um, I think, you know, at some point we need to, and we all, I think we all have that in our mind, we need to go beyond P and N classification to really identify the, the risk for patients. We've talked about CTD, and I think everyone acknowledges, you know, this is really uh, one of the most important, one of the most intriguing factors you'll see. So if you have a marker that is associated with a virtually 100% risk of recurrence, that trumps that word, but it trumps, you know, the T and N classification, it actually should, I think, potentially be even integrated in the AJCC classification, you know, like uh, molecular residual disease. And, you know, this is going to change the way we look at our pathologic staging because we cannot ignore the presence of tumor DNA as a marker of residual disease. And, you know, in the adjuvant setting, we talk about, you know, we need predictive markers. Not necessarily. We make a lot of decisions based on prognostic markers. We treat T4 N2 different than T1 N0 or T1 N, uh, N1, uh, T3 N1. So we already look at prognostic markers to make treatment decisions, duration of therapy, intensity of therapy. So if we have a very strong prognostic marker, where we still need to show that we can turn the medical history around and provide benefit and not have this inevitably be, let's say, uh, this, um, moving into stage four, classic stage four. Um, I think then we can just use prognostic markers to make treatment decisions, and CTD is one of those. Dr. Kennedy, any final thoughts on uh, molecular abnormalities in adjuvant treatment? Yeah, I, I think that um, I suspect we'll see uh, more about the molecular subtypes emerging from the IDEA uh, studies. I think that you know, the, the established markers that we're using are, are here to stay, including DMMR, nodal status, and TNN status. But I agree that you know, CTDNA does have the ability to kind of trump a lot of those. Uh, but then the question is, what do you do? And um, you know, I, I think it is worth emphasizing that at this time, you know, CTDNA is uh, just, quote unquote, a prognostic marker. We don't know whether it uh, identifies those patients that will predict, predict from therapy as well. I just wanted to add a comment about the VRAP. Um, we have done a retrospective uh, analysis of N0147 and PETAC-8 trial data. In those two trials, uh, in stage three colon cancer uh, patients, uh, there were two arms. One arm had Falsox, and the other arm had Falsox plus Ituximab. So when we um, did the retrospective analysis and tried to figure out what's the impact on a VRAP patient in stage three, we found something intriguing, and uh, uh, we presented that in ASCO last year. So if it is a low-risk stage three disease, MMR was protective. And so having DRAF did not impact their outcome. But if it is stage three high risk disease, then MMR, MMR, uh, DMMR did not matter. Uh, BRAF positive patients um, had a uh, worse outcome and uh, DMMR setup did not have any protective effect at all. Okay, Dr. Yeager, any final thoughts on the adjuvant treatment um, and use of molecular markers? 
I, I agree with what's been said thus far. I think the advances in treatment will, will push the relevance of these markers. They really are not strong prognostic factors in the early stage disease. Um, in BRAF, as you showed in the graph, the effect is driven by the very poor survival after recurrence. Even though there is an increased risk of recurrence, the um, outcomes are really driven by the poor survival when they recur. So as we have treatments that may have an effect, we may start thinking about these molecular markers earlier. Correct. Thank you. All right, so moving on to the metastatic setting, and uh, I know we are sort of running out of time, so we'll try to uh, run through this uh, fairly quickly, but I'll hand it this over to uh, Dr. Chakraborty to sort of lead the discussion on the metastatic aspect of things. Sure. So um, how do I advance the slides, or? Uh, I, I will advance the slides for you. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, so uh, this is a uh, patient I saw a um, few months ago. Uh, this is a 65-year-old woman in good general health. Um, she just moved into Wisconsin from another state, and then we ended up in the ER within a few days with a bowel obstruction. I want you to know that this is this was not because of Wisconsin cold. Um, <laughs> I will uh, explain what happened. Now, if you look at uh, uh, let's go back to that. If you look at uh, this patient, you can see that large fecal tumor on the right hand side. And then uh, you can see the small, you know, the dilated small bowel loop uh, <clears throat> the small bowel obstruction. So let's get into the story. So let's go to the second slide. So what happened? So she comes from a different state. August of 2019, she was diagnosed with uh, metastatic colorectal cancer in a little convoluted way. She presented with leukemia. And, and then, you know, workup and all that basically showed she had a fecal mass a number of peritoneal nodules, and there was a mass on the dome of the bladder, um, which was causing this diffuric symptom. Our baseline CDA was non-informative, uh, 2.3. However, CA99 was persistently elevated uh, in 130, 140 rings. Uh, colonoscopy did confirm the diagnosis, it did show um, poorly differentiated uh, adenocarcinoma. And the genomic profile was obtained, which is a BRAF mutation, uh, V600E, uh, TRFNS wild type, and microsatellite stable disease. Now, this patient had excellent because performance status at presentation um, and had hardly any comorbidity. Uh, so I'll go back to the next slide where it shows our scan at presentation. Um, if you look at the bladder dome on the left side, you can see an ill-defined mass. Exactly, thank you. Um, so there were a few uh, peritoneal nodules. There was a uh, moderate size fecal mass. She had no other metastatic lesions. She had no lung lesions, no bone lesions. She had excellent performance data. Uh, so let's go back to the previous slide. Uh, so my question um, uh, on that uh, scan. So my question to the panel would be, um, so this person, 64-year-old, something with excellent performance status, has moderate amount of uh, disease, but BRAF mutant tumor. Um, uh, I know Dr. Yeager has published data showing, uh, even with surgery, uh, outcomes not great. I think Dr. Grothy published uh, data from Mayo um, regarding the role of surgery. So my question to the panel would be, uh, let's start with Dr. Yeager. Um, what would be your approach uh, in this case, and what would be the goal? Uh, Dr. Yeager, please. Yeah, so in a patient, um, in this patient, I think the first issue is dealing with the bowel obstruction and seeing if that can be managed conservatively. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Actually, she did not have bowel obstruction at presentation. She had bowel obstruction later on, a year later when I saw her. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So, in a patient with um, BRAF-B600E, the story you give is very typical, right-sided, colon primary, a peritoneal disease. Um, sometimes a peritoneal disease is hard to see, but we have seen um, from studies that there is really a high rate of peritoneal disease and occult peritoneal disease. Um, generally, I treat them with systemic therapy. Um, we know that the risk of recurrence in patients with BRAF-B600E who undergo either perineal debulking surgery or removal of oligometastatic disease is higher. But if patients have an excellent response to treatment, 
um, then I start to consider the role of surgery. So I usually don't start with surgery. Um, I start to first to give some treatment and give a test of time to see how well the patients do. And I think as you're going to show at, at, at this moment, we have um, clinical trial, uh, trial data supporting target therapy second and later line. Um, but first line treatment is um, uh, uh, standard systemic therapy. Uh, wonderful. So, Dr. Kennedy, um, my question to you would be, uh, what would be your choice of systemic therapy? Yeah, look, I mean, this woman, unfortunately, has almost every bad, poor prognostic factor uh, that we know of in the advanced setting. Uh, the thing she has going for her is that she has a good performance status. Um, I would certainly agree with reviewing her at tumor board, but, uh, you know, to get a multidisciplinary input about, if not now, resectability sometime in the future. However, I agree the first-line therapy would be systemic therapy. And I would really, look, given her ECOG, I forgot her age, but I think she's less than 70. 64, yeah. 64. I, I would really straw, uh, consider full Fox theory and um, uh, and BEV uh, if there's no signs of, of bleeding, if there's some concerns, I may omit the, the BEV for the first couple cycles. But I think this would be a good uh, full Fox theory uh, candidate. Wonderful. Uh, so, question to Dr. Grothi. Um, so, I know that you have talked about uh, you started generally fall three knot. Uh, so, I would uh, please make some comments about that. And secondly, um, uh, do you add bevacizumab routinely in such situations? Um, uh, because I think there are uh, some folks who don't. Yeah. <clears throat> so, unless there are contraindications, I do add bevacizumab to, to a treatment. The discussion right now is whether a triplet can make a difference here over a doublet. I mean, initially, we, you know, BRIV C70 mutant tumor, intriguingly, you know, we're, we're kind of, we, we thought, you know, we need an aggressive treatment to counteract the aggressive biology. And I still believe that this is the right way to go in patients who can tolerate a triplet. And um, so even though the, the recent uh, pooled analysis, some Italian data, tribe data, it did not show benefit for a triplet over a doublet. But I still believe, you know, this would be my preference, you know, because, again, it makes biologic sense. And patients don't necessarily have access to second, third-line treatments beyond if we, if, um, uh, and even beyond the biologically targeted agents. Um, with Falterinox and Falfoxiri, I think, you know, that's moving into more semantics, you know, because, you know, these regimens are getting closer and closer to each other. Um, modified Falterinox and modified Falfoxiri, are so close that it, at West, for instance, we have merged these regimens into one to mm -hmm. treat pancreas scans and colon cancer with exactly the same regimen, and not in, to in order not to confuse uh, our pharmacists and, and nurses, actually. Wonderful. Perfect. Right. In the time, I will quickly tell you what happened in this patient. So, this patient was actually treated uh, outside um, with uh, modified false substance of the Susan and she did well. Uh, PR was, was the best response she got. She did well for about almost seven, eight months. And in May um, this year, uh, she had some symptomatic deterioration and really did not show a whole lot of things. But then her CA99, which was acting as a tumor marker, was going up. So at that time, um, appropriately, she was recommended in Corafeni plus the Tiximan. Uh, but then she was in the middle of the moving to Wisconsin and all that. So she really did not get any treatment for about six to eight weeks, and that's when she presented to our ER with um, uh, bowel obstruction. So at that time, she underwent extensive debulking surgery, um, and um, she she actually did fairly well with the surgery, uh, although had some uh, difficulties. Uh, so within a about a month after her surgery, I started her on infrared and even septicemab which she tolerated well. And the first scan after two months of treatment shows, the scan shows really does not show any residual disease. Although I know the bladder tumor could not be resected completely, the margin was positive, but the CA199 did come down drastically to 59 and she had marked symptomatic improvement. Um, so um, now a quick question, uh, if I may, uh, Sid, do we have a time for a question? Um, sure, we could. Uh, we do have to, I think Dr. Grothi has to leave as well, so we do have to finish uh, quickly okay. if we could. Okay, okay. So 
So, uh, my, um, well, well, we'll get to the questions later. I think I'll, I'll uh, quickly review this uh, uh, on this BRAF mutant uh, metastatic cholesterol cancer. Uh, as you know, it's 8 to 10 percent of the patients, and uh, median survival is really poor, 11 to 14 months. Uh, we know the biology as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, and we know why uh, targeting BRAF alone does not work, unlike melanoma. Uh, because of um, uh, this negative feedback by ERK is uh, taken away. Uh, so that's why we need to add a uh, EGF for directed therapy along with the BRAF inhibitor. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So the BCAP study has uh, tested uh, the triplet versus doublet uh, versus standard of care in the group of patients in previous patients. And as we all know, uh, Dr. Tropez has presented the uh, recent data. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, showing that uh, triplet and doublet performed a lot better with improvement of overall survival uh, over the control. And then, uh, next slide, uh, the more recent data shows that median overall survival is identical with doublet and triplet. And as a result, uh, let's go to the next slide. The FDA has approved the doublet <laughs> 60 Um Although we have to remember uh, doublet response rate is 20 percent, um, so uh, we, we have to see how uh, this combination works in the first line setting. Um, now, in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the third case. Um, actually, I just wanted to touch on the tribe data as well. Uh, that um, recently published TRIBE-2 has shown improvement in overall survival uh, in actually all subsets of uh, uh, metastatic cholesterol cancer patients with alpha theory plus vizosuzumab. Uh, both TFS2, which was the primary endpoint improved, as well as the overall survival. So I guess I, I, I would think that anyone who has good performance status uh, and has is able to tolerate false activity, uh, BEV uh, should be offered uh, that, that regimen. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, quickly, this is the data Dr. Grossi published from Mayo um, discussing the role of surgery in DF with mutant um, metastatic CRC patients and showing some moderate, modest uh, survival benefit uh, if patients underwent surgery. Uh, let's get to the next slide. So, uh, uh, does if uh, anyone wants to make a quick comment about uh, uh, this session too? Let me, let me just comment one thing. Uh, you know, we have first time data from the ANCRA study on ANCRA, nipinimetinib, and cetuximab, we biologic trip with a single arm study. Uh, one issue, and I, I, can, uh, I caution people moving these biologic agents into first-line BRAF mutant tumors because the duration of response in the PFS, medium PFS, was not as long as I would like it to be. So I still believe in Rona. I think you mentioned this earlier that standard chemotherapy, doublet triplet plus dev, is still the way to go in first-line BRAF VC center D mutant tumors. We are testing, we're going to test the biologic approach, the, um, the biologic doublet added to chemotherapy in the standalone in the upcoming breakwater study. Right now, there is no indication for first line encoraphnic cetuximab in DRVC and the mutant tumors. And I'm sorry, I have to, I need to get off this, uh, this panel because I have another commitment, but I really enjoyed our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grothy. Yeah, Axel. Thank, Thank you, Axel. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, so the patient three, um, so this is a rather straight, uh, somewhat straightforward, but um, I think has some new interest. So this is a 60-year-old man in excellent general health um, so presented to us. So this gentleman came a year and a half after his diagnosis, uh, but we'll go to the, his presentation uh, in the next slide. Uh, so this gentleman, uh, 49 years old, he presented um, to an Alfred hospital with abdominal pain, nausea, bloating, um, had excellent performance status, and uh, well-controlled hypertension. Um, echolonoscopy was done, which confirmed a large uh, mass in the 
as you can see um, in the transverse column, uh, which was uh, adherent to the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, colonoscopy did confirm adenocarcinoma, and on molecular testing, uh, the gentleman had the MMR tumor. Now, um, before I proceed, uh, if I may ask, um, let's say if this patient did not have such a large tumor, I think his symptoms of uh, bowel obstruction and this large tumor basically asked for a surgery right away, which he had uh, had. But what about if the tumor was not that large, but still large enough to uh, be adhered to the anterior abdominal wall, uh, but not much of obstructive symptoms, would anyone consider new adjuvant immunotherapy in such situation? Uh, Dr. Kennedy or Dr. Yeager? Yeah, I think that is a great question. Um, I mean, in this situation, I think you're acknowledging that this is a, a T4, if not, you know, M1 locally advanced unresectable tumor. And I agree that surgery. So then the, the question is, can, you know, what's the role of doing surgery when it is uh, more resectable. We have evidence from Foxtrot that you know, doing induction chemotherapy can improve at least uh, uh, some local regional surgical outcomes. Uh, so that, of course, was with full Fox uh, or three Fox chemotherapy. Uh, so what it, what it would be the role in this DMMR setting? Uh, to be honest, I think it would be a very tempting thing to do because it, uh, I think for the main reason is it would also offer access potentially to uh, a, uh, you know, either nivolumab or, or pembrolizumab in the setting, in the earlier stage setting, which we really would strongly feel you would benefit from. I'll share my experience a little bit here. So, so I had a similar patient uh, um, a few months ago. So we had a nice tumor board, and me and our surgeon, we decided that we go for pembrolizumab, uh, new adjuvant treatment, which we did. And uh, uh, we, we checked the scan, and essentially the mass looked the same. But then she underwent surgery, and it was all necrotic tissue. Right. So she, mm -hmm. she had complete response. So, uh, and we, you know, the similar data you see, there is a paper published in NEJM in lung cancer where they had a very small number of patients and they gave new adjuvant nivolumab, not really pembrolizumab, and uh, very ex excellent response rate, uh, including complete response rate as well as partial response. Just my thought. Uh, Dr. Jager, any comments? Yeah, I think there is data also in colon from the adjuvant setting that even um, a dose of uh, immune checkpoint inhibition before surgery can lead to a high rate of response. Um, it doesn't seem that this is something that can easily be resected now because of abdominal wall involvement. So whether it was mismatch repair deficient or proficient um, to shrink the tumor, it may help. So I just wanted to mention that this niche trial data uh, was uh, presented recently, uh, I think with 25 patients. And with the nevo EP combination, 60% people had complete pathological response, um, which uh, uh, kind of um, uh, attracted my attention. So moving on, um, let's, uh, so, so uh, this gentleman underwent surgery, and as you can see, surgeon had done really a great job, you know, very little tumor is left over. And at that time, um, the oncologist who was taking care of him outside, we were not involved at that time, um, they decided to treat him with Falfox. And I believe that was because um, T-Note 177 data was not available at that time. FDA did not approve it in the first line, I think. Uh, so he ended up getting Falfox 12 cycles without any response whatsoever. Uh, let's go ahead and do the next slide. And then when he came, to, so this, this is when he came to us, where quite a bit of tumor left, but relatively symptomatic. Uh, so he told us, if he could shrink it, then my surgeon would go in and take out leftover tumor. And the solution was easy for us, so we went ahead and gave him a uh, single pembro, 
Um, and then, as you can see, after about six months, there are hardly any tumor left, and then the recent scan does not show any evidence of disease whatsoever. So I guess the surgical surgery question is out, which is it's nothing to respect. My question to the expert panel would be, how long would you continue uh, pembrolizumab in this situation? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the most important question. Maybe let's uh, start with Dr. Kennedy, please. Uh, the duration of therapy question, uh, yep. excellent point, amazing response here. I think there's, we are getting some information from other tumor types about duration of, of therapy in the setting of complete clinical response, and it doesn't seem to be a consistent message uh, when looking at um, duration if you compare, for example, lung and, and melanoma. My understanding is for the Keynote 177 that the intended duration of therapy was 35, uh, which is uh, cycles, which would be approximately 105 uh, weeks, so it would be really uh, two years of therapy. So I would not do less than that, to be honest. Um, if you get this guy to uh, two years and he remains clear, uh, could you, you know, would it be re reasonable to stop or consider uh, circulating tumor DNA assays? Um, I, I think I would go to the two year mark. Wonderful. Dr. Yeager, your thoughts? Yeah. I, I agree as well. I would do two years of treatment. I agree there is some question if uh, doing one year may not be enough, and many of the trials have had two years. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, patients will be very happy because even after two years, I think it will be hard to get him off this treatment. He already started fighting me about it. But anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> Um, so, so that's why this, this kind of MSI high is my most very high. Uh, let's move on. Um, so I just wanted to uh, quickly summarize uh, Keynote 177, which has generated a lot of excitement. As you know, this is a first-line trial in metastatic BMMR colorectal cancer patients. Uh, randomization was between uh, systemic chemotherapy versus pembrolizumab. And then next slide, and the secondary uh, primary endpoints were PFS and OS. As we know, we have the PFS data showing uh, substantial benefits um, with first line pembro as opposed to chemotherapy. And the median, median PFS uh, is almost double. And importantly, 11% uh, people uh, had complete response. Um, so to put that in the perspective, so some of the stage 4 DMMR MR, uh, um, metastatic colorectal cancer can be treated just with immunotherapy and put into complete remission. And I think many of those people will be long-term survivors. I've already seen a few. Um, and the next slide. Uh, so also we have to uh, discuss this other uh, com competitor immunotherapy regimen, which is Ipilimumab plus Ipilimumab. Uh, Dr. Overman's data, which shows remarkable overall response rate of 55%. Um, and then, the, so, but we have to remember this is a, this is on previously treated patients. Um, so PFS is 12 months uh, and, and the side effects are quite manageable. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, so one question here quickly, uh, between single agent, uh, Pembro versus MODC, um, what does the panel prefer? Um, Dr. Yeager, maybe we'll start with you. I think it's a very good question. Um, we don't have the head-to-head -head data um, here. Um, I generally start with single agent immune checkpoint inhibition. The, um, as you see, the um, uh, activity is high and patients tolerate it well, though as we showed, not um, maybe a third of patients don't respond um, initially, um, don't, are refractory, primary refractory to um, an immune checkpoint inhibition. But I generally start with single agent. Wonderful. And Dr. Kennedy? Yes, I would concur. And, and you know, we're struck by the remarkable benefit of uh, the single agent pembrolizumab, but then also, you know, keynote 177, but also as 
uh, Rona pointed out, there are uh, is a subgroup of patients, and almost a third that that their best response was progressive disease. And you know, the question is, who are those patients? How do you treat them then? And does that then offer an an opportunity to either reflex over to chemo or add uh, ipilimumab? And which, and I think I'd be tempted to do the latter. Uh, so, but I agree that first, given that the uh, the very good outcomes overall, uh, I would I would go with single agent immunotherapy first. I want to quickly add that uh, we published some data with immunoscore in this situation, and uh, it looked like um, the the tumor with high immunoscore had a much higher response to immunotherapy. Uh, this was only on uh, like 14 patients, and the larger uh, study result will be available soon. Uh, that concludes my presentation, and again, I thank you, Binaitra uh, Foundation. Um, many thanks to Dr. Shah and Sid. Uh, thanks to the expert panel. Uh, I think uh, this was a very uh, learning-rich morning. Thank you. Thank you, Sakti. So um, I think we had a very good session. I would like to thank our panel members, uh, Dr. Yeager, Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Grothy, and Dr. Chakraborty for this outstanding discussion. Um, to summarize, I think uh, what we talked about today is that even in the adjuvant setting and in metastatic setting, there are several molecular markers that could potentially play either prognostic or predictive uh, role. And we talked about BRAF, KRAS, and RAS. We did not talk about HER2 or PIK3CA, but these are also emerging molecular markers as well. We talked about uh, MSI, MMR, oncotype, and CTDNA. And um, with that, I would like to open up the floor or to the expert panelists if they have any final thoughts uh, on today's discussions. My final thought is I think CTDNA is going to be incorporated in TNM staging system within the next few years. That's the prediction. Um, or in certain situations, I think CTDNA might even replace TNM guided adjuvant therapy decisions. I would say my final thought is that I think we are entering an exciting period where um, many of these molecular markers were. Um, first identified as important clinically in the setting of uh, resistance to EGFR antibody treatment as really negative markers. And now we're at a point where we're starting to have new, new treatments that may work in these molecular subsets. And we're learning, for example, from the BRAP story, how we can do combination treatments to improve our response rate. So there are drugs that are now being developed, uh, KRAS, allele-specific inhibitors, HER2 dual therapy, HER2 uh, ADCs. Um, there's a HER3 ADC that's being tested. So Hopefully, we're going to continue to refine our treatment and start, um, you know, putting some um, points on the scoreboard of how to treat these different molecular subsets. Great. I, I'm excited as well about the molecular markers, uh, specific and the and the uh, CTDNA. I did miss talking about the HER2 story in colorectal cancer this morning, uh, and you know, how do we integrate this with the agents already on the NCC guide and guidelines in the open uh, clinical trials we have. Uh, the the Ruxit-TCAN uh, data looks quite promising. Uh, I agree, lots more to come. And I, I just have been thinking about the last 10 years and colorectal cancer, things have been pretty slow, but I think they're picking up again. So look forward to that, it's good for patients. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions on the chat. So with that, I think um, I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Shah, again. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This was a really good discussion. And um, you know, I think there is a lot of uh, uh, still unanswered question in this field when it comes to molecular markers. But it's really exciting to uh, listen to all the uh, new data that is coming up in this area. So thank you all. And back to Dr. Shah.